Welcome everyone to our virtual conversation on reinventing the student journey. I'm Katie Mangan. I'm a senior writer for the Chronicle of Higher Education, and I'm delighted to be moderating today's panel. We all know that students are who are involved and engaged on campus are more likely to graduate, but those connections are becoming increasingly frayed. The pandemic, of course, took a huge toll on students' sense of connection in both academics and extracurricular activities. Faculty members are reporting that many students are checked out, stressed out, and questioning what their future holds. Today, we'll hear from three terrific panelists who will offer unique perspectives on how colleges can foster a sense of belonging among their students. We'll talk about the best ways to recruit students during this challenging time when so many students are questioning whether college is worth the investment of time and money. And each of them will offer specific strategies they've found to be helpful in keeping students engaged from the first time they reach out as applicants until they graduate and become hopefully happy and successful alums. Before we jump in, I'd like to go over a few technical details. If you're in the audience listening in, you're on mute, but we really want to hear from you. You can do that by asking questions in the Q&A box. Someone from the Chronicle will review those before they appear publicly. We'll get to as many as we can in the second half of the session, but we do read them all and they help inform our reporting as well as events like this. Feel free to post your own advice or resources here that are related to the discussion. We'd love for this to be a very interactive session. This event is being recorded and we'll be sending you a link within the next few days so you can watch it later on demand or share it with a colleague. This will include any resources we post during the discussion. About halfway through the session, the Chronicle's executive editor, Liz McMillan, will have a five to seven minute interview with the session's underwriter, Mongoose. She'll be talking with Dave Marshall, its founder and CEO. After that, we'll return to the panel discussion. If you run into any technical problems, please email us at connect at chronicle.com and someone here will troubleshoot. I wanna thank our writer, our underwriter, Mongoose, for making it possible to bring these important conversations to you. Now I'd like to introduce the panelists who I'll ask to turn on your cameras as I name you. Jamila Lin is Director of Specialized Programming at Benedict College, a private historically black college in Columbia, South Carolina. She's part of the college's student success team and is also a consultant on equity and belonging. Hi, Jamila. Terrell Strayhorn is a professor of higher education and women's gender and sexuality studies at Illinois State University. He also consults with colleges and universities on diversity and belonging. Thanks for joining us, Terrell. And Gail Zimmerman is Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs at the University of Virginia's College at Wise, a rural campus in the Appalachian region of Virginia. Thanks so much to all of you for being here. Fostering a sense of belonging has become such a critical goal for higher education. I'd like to ask each of you how college can avoid treating this as just another buzzword and fully embrace the challenges facing today's students who may be questioning how they fit in. Terrell, Terrell um, if I can start with you. Sure, thanks Katie. Um, and good, I guess morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where you are in the world. I'm glad to be part of this delightful uh, panel and looking forward to our discussion or conversation. Um, sense of belonging has certainly shown to be critically important um, in higher education, <clears throat> both before the pandemic and in this post-pandemic, endemic, um, new normal that we're living in. Um, it is has been the focus of my own research and scholarship for now about a decade. I think what makes it particularly important is that we have clear evidence, consistent um, research evidence theory driving this notion that when students um, are educated and trained, taught, involved, engaged in campus environments where they feel like they matter and they're connected to others and that there's a support system, 
not just an individual isolated moment of it, but a support network, a system, an ethos, an environment or campus climate all around that student centered, that is about connectedness and community where students are free and encouraged to be themselves as they are um, and that their identities and their histories and their experiences, the successes and the challenges are celebrated as a part of the campus community, as a part of the institution story. Um, they go to class, they, they join clubs and organizations, they are retained, they are engaged, they graduate at higher rates, they become connected alumni, and we may as well throw world peace in there while we're at it. Um, but I think sense of belonging is so important. So here's the thing, as I turn it over for uh, my colleagues to add, add their um, expertise as well. So sense of belonging matters, but what we've also learned is it doesn't happen automatically. Um, sense of belonging must be built. It must be nurtured, facilitated, engendered, fostered, promoted. Those are the verbs. Those are the words that we need when we talk about belonging. It doesn't just happen automatically. So now then we have opportunities like this that bring us together to think more deeply about this concept and what is it that institutions can do. By the way, institutions can't do anything on their own because they're just buildings. Um, but institutions are made up of leaders and faculty and staff and alumni and people, right, who make these institutions wonderful, who then can do things to foster the kinds of conditions that produce belonging and ultimately student success. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Terrell. I think that's so important to talk about this in terms of a system um, and a network and not just individual programs uh, that are rolled out one after another, that this has to be a much more systemic approach. Uh, really appreciate that. Uh, Jamila, I'd like to ask you the same question. Absolutely. And uh, thanks, Terrell, for laying that out. And certainly, I uh, want to echo your reflections. I think also, though, what might be important as we think about belonging is for institutions, right, to our communities, campus communities, to define who they are, right? Because belonging to what? And I think we lean on admissions teams and thinking about recruitment, right, and marketing materials. And so we have assets, we have websites, we have, but how do we take that and help connect students to a feeling of, I belong? It looks like this. It sounds like this. I think it goes beyond what we present on the surface. So it's really important that we define and reiterate, I would say, what the campus community is all about and how do we protect our students, right? So belonging to what exactly? How does that show up for students? How do we engage students proactively, right? Putting information in front of them, reaching out, not only when it's faculty convenient or staff convenient, but when it's convenient for students. That may involve us disrupting some of our traditional ways that we talk about um, student success to maybe expand access, right? Maybe we're having office hours in the evening because students get off at six o'clock and they're working full time. Maybe we're engaging on the weekend in a different way. So I think getting out of um, a kind of traditional model is really important, but at the, at the forefront of that, belonging to what exactly? And I think that changes, right? Institutional culture changes, uh, the QEPs and the strategic plans. And the as we go through kind of these ebbs and flows, I really think it's important for campuses to uh, be proactive in its articulation of who we are, how we're here to show up and support you, right? As opposed to kind of relying on the kind of external symbols of who we are for students to grab to. And I'll kind of pause there and allow our other colleagues to jump in. Thank you, Jamila. I think that's so important. Uh, there's so much talk about belonging, but you don't often hear colleges ex actually saying belonging to what? I think that's so important now that um, that be defined. And I really like the specific examples like weekend office hours and things like that that will really help um, today's diverse students uh, succeed. Uh, Gail, if we can turn to you, I'd like to ask you the same question about how we can get beyond just belonging as a buzzword to mean really mean something. Yeah, thank you. I certainly um, echo um, both Terrell and Jamila's um, comments to date. Um, 
Uh, also, you know, we are definitely challenged by um, the by the pandemic. We have to recognize and acknowledge that. And I, I think we'd all love to to not hear that word any longer. But um, you know, our students have been through two years of what I call learned disengagement. And that is where they, you know, would turn on a Zoom, watch a Zoom, turn the Zoom off, um, not leave their rooms, not leaving their houses, not really being in community. And so we're almost at a point where we have to redefine for the students what community means again and what that looks like. Um, and so you, you can't have belonging without that sense of community, belonging to what, as, as John had you know, mentioned. Um, so that's what we're really focusing on now and really um, being intentional about is this change and how we reestablish what that involvement means and looks like for our students. Thanks, Gail. I'd love to get back uh, some more to that discussion in the second half of our panel on um, the whole idea of of how you get students to re-engage after being apart for so long and being so isolated for so long. I think that's a real challenge that colleges are facing. Uh, I'd like to just go ahead and, and um, ask each of you a couple of specific questions uh, based on some conversations we had before this panel. We just had a really robust exchange uh, about some of the various ways that uh, colleges can foster the sense of belonging and engagement um, during this very difficult time. And uh, Jamila, if I can start with you, um, HBCUs have long prided themselves in the nurturing and the supportive kind of environment they provide for at-risk students. But this year is, is different in a lot of ways. Like how are some of the ways that you've had to adjust the kinds of supports that you provide for students uh, to make sure that they really feel connected? So couple things. Um, thank you for pointing out, right? The culture of care is uh, foundational to HBCUs. And I think for us, you know, what we talk about with this pandemic is that, you know, black and brown students were in crisis before COVID. And so when you think about um, the kind of compounded trauma that we are now paying attention to in a different way, Right. So I think it's one thing to understand anecdotally, right? Oh, this student is working full time. This student is a student parent. But now we have this data and this motivation, right? If you think about student success in, in, a, in a very kind of different way, we have a motivation now to pay attention to and pull the cover back on what really was always there, right? So as opposed to grabbing stories um, through advisors, you know, you may get. Um, a little insight right through your engagement with a student about what's going on right in his or her life, but now as an institution we're saying well let's look at FAFSA data. How many student parents do we have on campus? Um, let's look at food insecurity in a different way. Well, if we open a food pantry, we can collect some data there and we can understand better right um, why if students are on a full meal plan. Are they still experiencing periods where they don't have access to food? Well, let's talk a little bit about housing insecurity. Those students who live off campus, uh, commuter students who tend to kind of get lost sometimes in this work because so much of the program is geared to residential students. And so a forgotten population, if you will, right? How do we engage them in a different way? Is it a commuter lounge? Is it a reduced meal plan? right with x number of meals to help them when they're on campus if you're a student parent is it a lactation room is it a new approach to academic advising beyond just course scheduling right and so i think for us now there is a commitment an even deeper commitment to think creatively about how to pull these data together to make sure that we create a wraparound support model that is not necessarily about what we think students need, but is really driven by student voices and the articulation of their lived realities and the traumas. Because for us now, we're realizing, wow, children of incarcerated parents may need a different approach. Military may need a different approach, right? And so I just think this, this nuanced, um, intake now that Benedict has really adopted and implemented is so important because we are learning so much more about how our students are showing up and what we will need to do to keep them safe and to keep them supported. 
Thank you, Jamila, so much uh, important information there um, when you talk about the nuance and the need to address individuals' uh, needs and how a sense of belonging, it, it doesn't mean the same thing for all people. And uh, this is something that Terrell, you and I have talked about a little bit. I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more from you about some of the specific strategies you've heard that work with specific populations uh, in both on your campus and in your uh, consulting with other campuses around the country. Yeah, that's great. And <clears throat> I appreciate um, all this we've that's been shared by both Gail and Jamila. So, you know, I think about um, belonging theory and research as it relates to programming. And I think what's exciting about, you know, as a professor, former provost and chief academic officer is to know that, you know, research and theory actually can inform practice and should. Um, and that I actually see um, a good deal of symmetry. I think it is up to the researchers and theorists to make it quite um, accessible to practitioners to know how do I translate this um, to practice. But let's just talk through a couple of them and give you a couple of examples. One is sense of belonging <clears throat> is about basic needs. I mean, I write about it in the theory of belonging, that <clears throat> belonging is a need. Um, that's not just a basic physiological need, although Jamila and others have already alluded to the fact that, look, you can't be retained or pass a chemistry test when you're hungry. Um, and it's hard to pay attention to math when you're tired because you didn't get sleep at night. So we've got to pay attention to basic needs and securities, and that's how it connects to student success through belonging. But um, it's a basic need, very foundational to what students are looking for in terms of their learning. So when institutions intentionally and strategically take steps to really tackle students' basic needs head on, I believe colleges and universities are doing the work to build environments where belonging is possible. Um, you know, I've tweeted about this a billion times. I think it's worth repeating. Um, you know, we know that one, tackling basic needs is a part of the belonging formula. We also know that when students connect with faculty and staff, um, it builds the kind of relationships that promote belonging. So some institutions incentivize this kind of connection through take a professor or staff member to, you know, it's breakfast at Dartmouth, it's lunch at Penn State in Michigan, Kansas and Ohio State, it's a lunch and learn at the University of Pennsylvania, it's take your professor to coffee at San San Jose State University. Um, and then there's some institutions like my own where you can pick the meal. Um, sometimes these are powered through student affairs offices. Sometimes they're student affairs working with um, academic affairs. But, you know, the, the genius of these interventions is that they largely are designed and developed to catalyze the kind of educationally purposeful relationships between students and faculty that will lead to belonging. Um, we also know that, you know, basic needs are not just food insecurities and housing insecurities. Um, and it's not just, you know, not having a place to, to stay at night, although that's critically important. Sometimes students have, you know, medical needs and um, got to pay rent, got to pay um, cell phone. And so there are some institutions like Georgia State that have a Panthers emergency grant program all about making sure that students don't feel like they are on their own without financial um, dollars to Jamila's point, even HBCUs often, um, you know, build that community or culture of care. So at Lemoyne Owen College, one of my previous institutions, they have a last mile retention grant program that's modeled after that Georgia State intervention. Um, and, there, and there, there are a number of those kinds of them. Let me just close with one other basic need, and then I'll save some of the other elements for later in the conversation. Um, you know, many students nowadays, especially in this post-pandemic, endemic, new normal, um, our commuters, you know, have jobs, come to campus to work. So now you have a new cost of education called gas, which is super duper high in price. And so some institutions really start building a place of belonging where students pick up this sentiment, this feeling like, wow, they really care about me and my basic needs by providing gas cards to help defray the cost of um, transportation. That's what it is at Cuesta College, which is a Hispanic serving institution at Missouri State University, um, West Plains. They actually provide gas vouchers through their program. And then there are some institutions like Allen Hancock College and Compton College that actually use student IDs to provide free um, bus passes to students. So again, great 
programs, interventions, track on to basic needs, fostering the sense that I'm a part of the community, people care about me, um, that will ultimately lead to success. Thank you, Terrell. Those are wonderful examples. Um, I really lo love the idea of the take a professor or staff member to lunch or breakfast or whatever. And of course, the college will provide the money so that they don't have to do that out of their own pocket. But um, that's just a, a great example among many that you cited. Um, Gail, if we could turn to you. Uh, your campus has taken a really interesting approach, which we wrote about recently, um, to the issue of student apathy by uh, creating a new position that you're calling a vibrant, camp a vibrant campus coordinator. Can you tell us why you posted that job and what you hope that person will be able to help you accomplish on your campus? Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, what we saw when students returned um, in person from the pandemic was really a loss of um, leadership roles and responsibilities, the transition that normally happens from year to year with student clubs and organizations. So that, you know, in the past, um, the upper class students who were the previous uh, student leaders of those clubs and organizations would pass that information down to the next um, group of students coming in. And we, you know, we lost um, a lot of that in the pandemic. Some, many of the clubs and organizations didn't survive coming back. So um, the, the num just the pure numbers of clubs and organizations has been dramatically reduced. So um, we decided to be very intentional about how we reestablish those and have a, um, and so we created this position that would work with our students to do some of that mentoring and um, education about how to run a club and organization. Some of it's really nuts and bolts stuff. How do you run a club and organization? Um, what are the roles and responsibilities that um, help drive a, a club or organization, the exec boards and the leadership roles, and then provide get, getting those leadership opportunities back into the system for our students. Because again, you know, we know as much of what Terrell has been saying about involvement and engagement is what affects um, retention and persistence. So um, by the, the terminology vibrant campus has been part of our strategic plan all along in terms of creating a vibrant community. And so we took that language to um, really focus in very intentionally on reestablishing these um, clubs and organization involvements for students. Thank you so much. That's that's very helpful. And I, I wanted to pick up on another um, uh, thread that we talked a little bit about, this idea of commuter students as being sort of a forgotten population. Um, uh, Jamila, I wonder if I could go back to you. Um, when we talk about student engagement, very often we're thinking in terms of the students going to football games and hanging out in the dorms. And you know, for so many of our students, obviously that's not that's very far from from their reality. Um, how can a campus make those students feel connected when college is just one of several competing demands on their time and energy? Yeah, so you know, I think it comes back to like, how do you help students find their people? right? What does that community look like? And we go beyond, you know, region, right? I remember being in school when we had, you know, a Maryland club, a DC club. Beyond that, right? I think we start thinking about specific, unique student attributes. So the athletes are here. That's pretty much a kind of built-in baked community, right? Um, but you start thinking now about, again, the lived realities and how do those show up and how do those help us to inform uh, and create right community. I think it's really important for students to understand, you know, where do I go on campus for resources and often students will say it feels like you know i'm shooting in the dark here right the information is not at the forefront we don't. Um, tag, for example, you know, the, the Student Success Center in multiple places on a site. Like, how do we think about putting information and resources and people? Because look, you can have high impact programming, high impact policies, but if you don't have high impact people driving that work, right, to make the connection, 
it's going to fall apart. And so you need to have people who understand student talk, right? Who can make it plain, who can find a way to be a connector, right? Between students and campus resources, you know, who is available, who is responsive, who is empathetic, who understands that advising is more than transactional, right? Exchange, it's more than course, you know, scheduling, but it really is about this kind of holistic awareness and development of students. And so when you think about commuters, often they feel left out, right? Left out of that, you know, conversation and that experience. And so I think that is a population in and of itself. So for example, how do we orient commuter students to the campus? What are some of the differences there? Because there are a ton of them. And if you think about age, right? Even this, some of the language is so dated, traditional students. I mean, traditional by what standards? And how might that be, you know, excluding, right? These other populations. So I think for, for Benedict, we have been really cognizant about using language that is inclusive. We've been cognizant about talking about equity through all of our campus processes. And again, I mean, even holding space for commuters. I mentioned the lounge earlier. Believe it or not, that physical space, it doesn't have to be fancy. We first started thinking about this. We were thinking big because we were looking at bells and whistles. And we were so shocked to just hear from students that the physical space alone, designating that, reserving that is significant enough. It's a starting place, it says, we are here and we're not at the margin, right? When you talk about student success and support. And so I think holding physical space is important. And how do we, again, do that in a nuanced way that takes into account the concerns? I love what uh, Terrell talked about in terms of gas, right? Right now, I'm thinking about um, car repairs. I have a student who was ready to drop out of school for a $200 flat tire. I need to know that. I need to know that because I have some money here from an emergency standpoint through project success and HERF, right, and other sources. But if I don't know that the student needs 200 bucks for a new tire, then I can't make that connection. So it goes back to those kind of intrusive, high impact people, because we really do rely on those staff members and faculty members to help us make, you know, be aware of the student needs so that we can turn this around because we know all of these requests are generally, you know, time sensitive, right? And so it's really, really important that those kind of lines of communication and the trust is there, right? That students know if I reach out that you're gonna get back to me and you're gonna get back to me with a solution. And you're not gonna pass me off from office to office to office because this is not my lane or this is not my work, right? So student care and protecting students, it's all of our work. And so that is the approach that we take at Benedict. And again, holding space, thinking about language, equity, you know, across the board here has been very helpful for us to create, you know, a meaningful uh, feel good community, right? For commuter to students. Thank you, Jamila. Those are such important um, tips. I think just for this population that like you all have said, is often sort of an afterthought. Um, the idea of commuter lounges, gas, uh, car repair, those are all really great tips. Um, well, at this point, I would like to take a short break to give my colleague Liz McMillan a chance to interview Dave Marshall um, from our underwriter, Mongoose. Uh, so panelists, if you want to go ahead and uh, mute yourselves and turn off your cameras, I will turn it over to Liz. Great. Thanks so much, Katie. And I'd like to welcome uh, Dave Marshall, uh, who is founder and CEO of Mongoose. Uh, which helps colleges and universities streamline communication with students. Uh, welcome, Dave. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Liz. Uh, I'm happy to be here today. So uh, the panel, which has been great so far, has been talking broadly about experience, the, improving the student experience. And I'm curious about what some of the issues you're seeing in terms of improving student experience, especially around engaging with students. Yeah, so I... I think that um, I am excited that I have a kind of a unique perch on which I can kind of watch what's happening in higher ed. We have 750 schools that use our tech to text and chat with students. So we hear every day 
about the challenges and what's working and what's not working. And I, and I always think that higher ed is so full of staff that are compassionate and empathetic and caring and that want the best for their students. The real challenge is uh, getting them connected with the actual student. Uh, these The types of communications that are most prevalent on campus are kind of this broadcast messaging alerts and there's so much of it it just kind of fades into the background and um, schools that can be really sick really successful I loved uh, the high impact people uh, right that that we that can have real conversations with students and get them connected to the resources that can help them mm -hmm. um so one of the things that you and I talked about are some of the concerns you're seeing uh, in those communications from students. Are there any uh, ones in particular that you wanted to raise? Students, students today now have real concerns. Our clients are often asked about, um, are there going to be layoffs at this institution and how secure should I really feel? Um, we spoke a lot about the myriad of responsibilities that today's students have. They have family obligations. They they have so much going on to, if the institution is, is able to provide um, responsive and immediate support, uh, that's helpful. And part of, you know, if we were to make a list of like the, the top 10 issues, it might change day to day. So we've found that communication that is um, flexible enough, asking open-ended questions that allows students to take it in any way that, that they want to, to say that my car broke down, I need a new tire, <laughs> because you're not gonna write down, did, did anybody's car break down today, right? So if you can just have those conversations and see what comes up, that's really effective. Mm -hmm. So keep it general, uh, keep it flexible. Are there any other opportunities that you think colleges have to take advantage of, in, of to improve uh, what students are experiencing on campus? I think one of the, the tactics, if you want to call it that, that I've seen a lot of our clients be successful with is being a liaison between the students and the community. The mm -hmm. community that the colleges are in, often in um, are rich with resources. And if the students are able to be exposed to, to those resources, that can be really helpful. I've also seen our clients not only have meaningful conversations with students, but with the workers at the institution that are exposed to the students, people that might work in food service or in security and ask them what's going on, what's the pulse, uh, how how can we better connect and engage with our students? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, a really great suggestion. And so, you know, as a college is, is trying to get better at this, how do you track and measure if you're actually being effective? How can institutions know whether they're uh, whether they're doing the right thing? There's, of course, the very standard metrics of, you know, app, app completion, did, did, did they enroll, did they persist, uh, were they retained, did they graduate, so those, those, those high level uh, metrics, but, but I, would, I, would, I would say be very open to the softer metrics, like how are we doing in, in, in event participation, what are the traffic patterns on campus, where are, where are they going. Um, our counseling appointments being used, um, and it, it and it really is being being open to the softer metrics of that you can kind of get a pulse for how connected your campus feels. Um, how many responses are you getting from a social post that was open ended and helpful and asking for people to give feedback? Um, so measuring and the engagement there is really helpful but at the end of the day it all does come down to metrics and around what's your retention rate what's your persistence and how many of the issues were we able to resolve successfully mm -hmm. great 
Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, and thank you very much uh, to Mongoose for making this conversation possible. I'd, I'd like to hand things uh, back to Katie and the panel. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. And thank you, Dave, so much. We really appreciate your support and uh, the suggestions that you made and the insight that you're getting from students. I uh, did want to uh, give us a ch chance to address a few of the questions. We've had a lot of interesting questions come up uh, in our Q&A box. And I'm going to start right out by throwing out one. Um, this is from Amanda, who says that both as a professional and as an ABD ED student, my research interest lies in the onboarding period from deposit to meticul meticulation. What successful strategies have you encountered for engaging students within a digital space to secure better matriculation outcomes and ultimately prevent melt? This is obviously a huge concern, students who say they're gonna show up and who for various reasons don't. And would any of the panelists like to talk about some of the steps you're taking to make sure that those students stick with it and actually enroll? I'll, I'll talk about one initiative that we um, implemented because of the pandemic, but was so successful that we're maintaining it. And that is um, our orientation program. You know, I used to wait till students arrived on campus and then they would meet with the uh, in groups, you know, small groups, seven to 10 students with a faculty member for advising, get registered for their classes and then go home until our welcome week. Um, with the pandemic, we shifted to Zoom advising sessions, which were one-on-one, -on -one, so face-to-face um, -face with a faculty member um, individually. And the, both the fa faculty's perspective as well as the student's perspective, they loved it. It was it, in, um, personal, it was direct, um, it occurred over the summer. So before they even arrived on campus for orientation, they've already met with a faculty member for their for their first advising session. Um, and that that really um, was a great connection and one that we're gonna maintain and keep going forward. That's a great example. I know in my own situation, when my son went and was visiting campuses, he was so impressed by the fact that he had an opportunity to meet with a faculty member before he had even applied. And those kinds of things make a, a big difference for students feeling that they're really going to be welcomed on campus. Is there anyone else who'd like to add something? Yeah, I'll, I'll add that. And Gail, I'm so glad you shared that because that summer before the fall semester is just so critical to your point. We actually built out a virtual orientation platform with the help of a third party and several HBCUs have had success in the space. So there was this kind of community of best practices that we could lean into. But for us, we were thinking about how do we create connection before they step foot on campus, right? And so that summer, not only how can we create connection, but how can we present information in a way that is digestible? As you know, the welcome week or new student week is just action packed. Competing programs, students are making decisions about like, where should I go, A or B? This is information overload. I can't retain all of it. And it just, to me, you know, it, it forced us in COVID to rethink the effectiveness, right, um, of new student orientation as such. And so we thought about, you know what? let's spoon feed them this information and give them the opportunity to work at their own pace, to bookmark, ask questions through a bot, contact through email, through a click of a button. Like let's really take this, this digital access and ramp it up so that new student orientation the week in August is really just dovetailing, right? What we've already built and rolled out the summer before. And so, the beautiful part about this orientation is not only is it segmented and kind of tracked, right? New students click here, returners, because we realize the refresher is really important for returners, especially with IT support. But not only is it tracked, but you can actually ask questions and connect through you know, two real people like myself through the virtual orientation. You can pause it 
You can save your spot. You can bookmark certain files or modules that are of particular interest or may be confusing to you. And you want to go back and kind of follow up on that. And so it is learner centered. And at the end of it, right, you earn a certificate of completion. I went through this. This is what I've learned. And then we tie that with the college experience course. So you find a way to make that meaningful in the curricular sense, but also the access to that platform is year round. So you can go back and you can revisit and we encourage our college, you know, experienced students and teachers, right, faculty members to use that platform uh, as part of the content. And so I think just really forging those connections early, putting information out there in a way that students can take it in at their own pace, save and go back. All of that is the customizable piece that I think has been so very uh, helpful to our students to onboard them as well. Yeah, those are so such important points about um, the need to explain things in ways that students can understand. You know, a lot of first generation students maybe aren't familiar with terms that we throw around and just assume everyone knows. And just being able to put this information out in easily digestible manner that students can return to uh, throughout the year is so important. Um, thinking about um, orientation, uh, Terrell, you and I talked a little bit about Another specific example that I thought was really interesting, I think this was in an orientation, but it was a wristbands that students could wear that would help um, help identify their comfort level in, in speaking with other students and, and other people they meet on campus. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, oh my gosh, so many different points, um, both in the conversation as well as in the Q&A and um, great discussion. So this specific example, can actually be embedded in a you know, first year orientation. Um, it could be powerfully uh, incorporated, I think, in the summer bridge program. The example that Katie's talking about is um, at Iowa State University's College of Agriculture. This is post pandemic reality. They're welcoming students back. Um, and we realize that you know, for most of us, we're going back to familiar places, right? campuses, classrooms, laboratories, cultural centers that we once knew, but we have changed through the pandemic. Our, our colleagues, our peers, staff has changed. Some buildings have changed, but also most importantly, the terms of engagement have changed. And so what they did, um, which really connects to this, if I can park a little idea, right? So sense of belonging, according to theory, is about community and connectedness. We've known since the 90s from Boyer's principles of community, that some characteristics of community are things that, you know, communities are marked by being just and they are marked by being inclusive and disciplined. They got certain rules, right? But they also are um, marked and characterized by shared celebrations and traditions. All right, now back to Iowa State's College of Agriculture. So as they're welcoming students back and realizing the terms of engagement have changed, what they did, which um, was part of their, you know, sort of onboarding of new students, anyone can use this, I think, is they took newly um, branded plastic rubber wristbands like this. Some were red, some green, some yellow. And then came up with a whole entire experience around the band. So if you have a red band, it's like, hey, I like to keep some distance, you know, um, greet me from afar. Um, yellow means I prefer elbow bumps and other kinds of um, ways of engaging that were safe. And then green means, hey, I'm cool. Come on, high five, give me a hug, welcome me back. And they pass these out to all students. By the way, if you're going to do this, don't get them for just students because faculty and staff will get jealous. Then you have to order more for faculty and staff. And by the way, don't just do it for one college because before you know it, other students and other colleges will hear about this tradition, right? That's how they're going to hear it. Wow, that your college is cool. It's got these bands. It's got this whole experience built around it. That's the intentionality that we've been talking about that helps students feel safe, but also feel part of something because you know how to use the band and the um, practices that are associated with it. Before you know it, you've got to turn it over to the whole vice president of student affairs and put it um, across the whole institution. That's just another example that I think can be um, embedded in different experiences, orientation, summer bridge. I could even see it at the graduate level. Um, a different one that is also transportable, though, um, you know, sense of belonging is about um, programs. It is about services. It is about um, safety and security. 
uh, community and traditions. But I also think that one of the things we, you know, this is the harder part of belonging, is that um, it's not in the one-off programs. It's not in a single strategy. No single strategy is going to move the needle on belonging um, so consistently that it will lead to um, you know, higher levels of retention, higher levels of persistence. I saw those kinds of questions in the chat. Um, what we know is that when institutions have intentional strategy, right? So that's why sense of belonging is the strategic plan at Kent State. It's the strategic plan at Colgate University. It's the strategic plan and a social, uh, social media belonging campaign at Amherst College because it does take that kind of um, intentionality around it. So for instance, when institutions realize, hey, we got to know more about our students because you simply can't transform or change something you don't understand. So one of the things Kent State did was a whole process mapping experience that allowed them to look at the journey for students through their institution, right? Identifying touch points and high points, pain points and contact um, issues, stop gaps, so they could create efficiencies. One of the things that came out of it was they realized there were several chokeholds for students um, there were students who were at their institution who couldn't access technology, didn't have the resources to do it. So that led to part of a larger strategy that um, includes loaner laptops. Loaner laptops does not produce belonging, but when loaner laptops are embedded in a larger multi-part um, strategy that really deals with students' basic needs, the things that we've talked about today, it can do that. And then they also realize that most students who leave Kent State, just talking about them as an institution that I understand and know, um, most students that leave, leave for finances. So as another part of this multi-part strategy, they also created the Flashes Go Further Scholarship, which provides the kind of need-based emergency aid to students who really need it that we've been talking about. Um, I'll stop there. There's so many other examples, but I think what I hope you hear is that one, um, belonging has a science to it. It's got a theory to it, but it doesn't have to be hard. <laughs> it doesn't have to be difficult, um, but it also is not as simple. I was on a plane one day and happened to be sitting beside someone in our field who will go unnamed because I didn't know them anyway. Uh, and they were talking to me and they said, oh, I work at this institution. And we started talking about what we do. And they said, you know, look, I got a couple thousand dollars left in my budget what should I use that money for to impact belonging it doesn't work that way belonging is so much more complicated um, and by the way just as much as we're talking about what can build belonging a single moment of being alienated ostracized oppressed harmed ignored um, Jamila and Gail have talked about it. A student sends a note into the abyss and no one ever gets back to them. They have a question as simple as how do I pay my parking ticket and they don't know how to get it answered. I was on a campus one day and a student was crying saying, I just want tutoring. In high school, the tutor came to my classroom. How do I find tutoring? That's why at places like Texas Christian, they use their social, their university app to provide students access to the campus map which also helps them through a directory identify, how do I get supplemental instruction? How do I get tutoring? And they can, you know, it's powered with Google Maps and other things that make this very large campus easy to navigate. Navigational strategies is part of it. So I'm saying that um, as much as we're talking about how to build it, please understand that it can be undone. So we must also be careful to build policies, procedures and programs that affirm students' identities. That's why I, I applaud the work of George Washington University that's redone their student information system to make sure that students can declare their preferred name and their pronouns so that when they go into the classroom, they're called by the right name. Everybody, this is not Cheers, the TV series. Everybody wants to go to a place where somebody knows their name. But listen, for our trans and non-binary students, it is psychologically and socio-emotionally harmful and devastating to be, to be dead named, to be called by a name that you don't identify with. So again, that's the strategy. And again, I think Mongoose and other technologies are very powerful for helping campuses do this. Um, but when we do that hard work, it leads to belonging and ultimately student success. Thank you, Terrell. I think what you make such an important point that this has to be part of, uh, we have a, a question from the audience or a comment from someone in the audience talking about how, you know, how can institutions scale the sense of belonging uh, to become uh, more than just 
disparate individual programs. And, and what you're talking about is, the, yes, there are a lot of very important programs that are going on, but they have to be part of a systemic uh, overview and something that the entire campus is committed to. Um, you know, uh, someone else, uh, another viewer, uh, Alan, wrote that he, I, I don't want to in any way diminish the significance of special needs like food and housing that many students have. But what can we do to engage students who don't have one of those particular critical needs and still don't seem to have much interest in participation in campus life? Um, and Gail, I might ask you to comment on this because we talked a little bit about just this sense of apathy and how can uh, sort of clubs and activities and how can we get students who just are kind of going through the motions and don't really seem to be truly connected to their campuses? What are some of the ways that we can get those average students who may not have the sort of special needs that we've talked about, but who just are a little bit checked out? Yeah, and I, I, again, I think that that goes back to this learned disengagement uh, of the past two and a half years, right? And the disruption of um, student leadership um, patterns and traditions. And so um, one of the things that um, both Jarrell and Jamila have um, mentioned and, and I've used in the words that I've used is intentionality. We have to be intentional about what we are doing and how we are engaging our students. And some of that is going to be dependent on the culture of the institution that you're at. Um, you know, you really need to understand what are the norms of the community that you're in, both um, the campus community, but the larger community as well. And then how do you um, how do you respond vis-a-vis -vis that, that particular culture? Um, and uh, so really getting students to um, uh, to be to know that they can design the type of engagement that they want, um, but the campus has to be ready to support that as well. And so, um, you know, that that's some of the uh, of what we are trying to do here is just be very intentional um, about that and creating. You know, there's been some recent literature um, that uh, really looks at even if a student makes one connection with one other faculty or staff member at the institution, it, the, it can significantly impact retention of that individual student. So we keep talk, looking at the whole and the group, um, but we really have to, when a student is in front of us, we have to be responsive to that student. And that's how we create the community of care and the community of belonging. Thank and you. If, and you had mentioned that. Made, Katie, oh. may I just add just a quick thought? Yeah, to absolutely. Um, I love the synergy between the student and the faculty staff person, but also the power of peer to peer connection, right? Um, that is so important. And for us, we've been really careful about diversifying the student leaders and even expanding the definition of a student leader to include perhaps, you know, students who don't have the 4.0 GPA, who don't have, you know, these kind of off the chart GPAs, but who show grit and resilience and have overcome some things that could be relatable, right, to other students, because maybe that's the way we develop leadership, not only thinking about the academic self, but also looking at, you know, students lived circumstance, right, and, and how we may lean into that and leverage that to create even more communities, Terrell, that you talked about, right, again, moving away from the kind of 3.5 to 4.0s, but also finding leadership perhaps in the middle, because I think their strength there and community and belonging can really come from seeing a person who, wow, I have a 2.5 too. You have a 2.8. Let's talk about that. There's connection there. And I think for so long, back to what I was saying about tradition, right? And how we prioritize value and worth on a campus. I think this is an opportunity to rethink that as an institution to make room for all of our students to have an opportunity to lead without just thinking about the selective few. I, I think also when you talk about um, students finding their community, I, I wondered too about the importance of groups like whether it's uh, in common interests on racial equity or climate or just how important is it to offer uh, activities and clubs 
for students who have common interests to get together on campus. Is there anyone who'd like to uh, talk about that? I think that that's the whole, um, you know, especially on larger campuses, we're a small rural campus. Um, and, and those involvements are really important in terms of creating a community. But on larger campuses, they're critical. Um, because the they, students can get lost, uh, feel as if they're just, you know, one of a number. Mm -hmm. um, and so how, whatever we can do that will increase a sense of community, increases that sense of belonging, and increases the, the level of involvement and engagement with the community. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that's the... Student clubs and organizations are not just about having fun. There is a, there is a, as we all know, we're to, to preaching to the choir here. Um, but there is a, there is a reason why we do those kinds of activities and why we give those opportunities to students is to create a sense of belonging, to create a sense of community, and to provide the leadership opportunities that will further um, develop their skills so that when they leave the institution, they're really successful alum and um, productive. Thanks. And Gail, by the way, uh, someone in the um, audience had asked if, if she could see the position description from the college at WISE for the vibrant community engagement. So maybe at some point you can post that and we can share that um, when we send out the uh, uh, version in a couple of days. Um, also wanted to ask uh, another uh, another listener writes about, uh, it raises an interesting question about the faculty and staff response to the potential shift in providing support and services outside of traditional hours. Uh, how do people feel about office hours on Saturdays, uh, responding to emails in the evenings? Is, is that a, a challenge or can anyone talk a little bit about that? Jamil, I see you nodding. Is this, has this become an issue on your campuses? How do people feel about it? Well, a um, couple of things. I think when you contextualize it as um, a strategy to promote access that is learner-centered, taking into account that students are working full-time because they have to. They are caretakers. Benedict College is 84% Pell dependent. We don't say Pell eligible. If not for the Pell grant, they would not be enrolled. So when you help faculty to understand beyond a student ID number, who is on your roster, who is showing up? It's been my experience that our faculty have been very empathetic. But again, you know, there was this, this gap right? Like they didn't understand all of the layered experience that really informs how students engage, right? So Terrell, you talked about, you know, you have to feel valued, you have to feel seen, and then you show up differently, right? Well, I think for faculty, students were showing up and faculty had no clue just how complex, right? their lives uh, inside and outside of the classroom really were. And so the job of the student success team became to connect those dots. And so we had workshops and we talked to them about, you know, here's the data. This is what the HERF application shows. These are the highest categories of need. Students live in technology deserts where they have to go to a local McDonald's, even if the McDonald's is closed to grab Wi-Fi. Um, when you start thinking about how students are, are punished, for their zip codes, I think it's really, really hard to turn your back to that kind of information. Guess what? We started telling stories. Storytelling has been tremendously impactful at Benedict College because it humanizes the student. So now you are inclined to, you know, do more than just record a grade. You want to find out what's going on with that student. And you're intervening early. You're not waiting until midterm because you understand that the window is close to being closed at that point. And so we have just been so happy to continue to educate our faculty about who's on this campus, who's in your classroom, here's the data, this is what we know. We've had so many faculty members and staff members to contribute to our food pantry, right? Because again, we know that if we make the needs clear that the campus community will show up and it has shown up at Benedict College. But again, that critical moment of saying, this is the data, 
here are the stories, making that plain for faculty and staff has really been instrumental in forging that kind of connection. Thank you so much, Jamila. Well, we're coming to the end of the hour. Uh, we could go on uh, all day talking about this. This has been a wonderful conversation and you've given me a lot of ideas to follow up on and I hope our audience as well. Um, I'd like to give each of the panelists a chance to highlight any key tips or strategies, or if there's anything that you wanted to talk about that you didn't have a chance to, and that you can uh, talk about briefly, uh, we're just gonna make one, one last round here before we close the session. Um, and Terrell, I'm going to start with you. Uh, great, great conversation. Great job, Katie, on uh, facilitating it and to all the folks in the audience. I mean, we could talk for another 10 hours about this, um, except that you won't be here. Probably neither will I. So, you know, I invite folks to connect on social media, TL, Strayhorn, LinkedIn, and the like. Um, you know, Jamila's last point reminded me that, you know, as a, as I say, provost and former chief academic officer or recovering um, administrator, um, that what we are really talking about in these um, institutional, intentional, deliberate strategies really should be an attempt at kind of innovating. I know that word is kicked around in the academy a lot, um, but in a way that I don't think it actually, um, you know, lives up to its definition. My point is, you know, having faculty extend their work hours has a place, especially when you have deeply committed and passionate faculty. However, um, I've had deeply committed and compassionate faculty who are student centered, who, you know, have complicated lives and just need me to understand that they don't have a whole lot more to give. And so I had to think creatively about how I would use part time adjuncts and um, affiliate faculty and other non instructional staff in ways that will allow me to extend the hours for academic advising, for um, mentoring for students. And so I just put that out in the atmosphere for us to think about. And again, a good model, UC Merced, one of the UC's uh, system's newest campuses has what they call the Bobcat One-Stop Shop. It has extended hours, but they're um, employing people kind of around the clock to help that power. So I would say this, look, sense of belonging is everywhere. Um, it's everywhere in my mind. It is um, on a sign at Kent State, it's a t-shirt at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. It's a notebook at the University of Kentucky. It's a website at the University of Michigan uh, School of Music. It is the strategic plan at places that I've talked about. It is everywhere. Just because you see it everywhere doesn't mean it's easy. Um, it requires work, deliberate action, strategy, resources, time, focused attention. Um, it doesn't happen automatically. It's not found. I know I wrote that in 2008, don't listen to me. Um, it's not found, it's created, it's constructed, it's built, it's fostered. It is an institutional um, imperative. I would say an institutional responsibility. In one of my interview studies, a student said to me so plainly, why in the world would a college admit a student who doesn't belong there? That's such a powerful question. So because we admit them, we have a responsibility to make sure that they feel a sense of belonging and find success there. Um, but admittance is not acceptance. And so we have to do the work to make sure they feel included, they are experiencing equity, they do experience diverse climates, but ultimately they can be successful. I close where I always close. That is, students don't come to college for any other reason than to graduate and get a degree. And so it's been great to be a part of the panel. Thanks, Katie. Thank you so much, Terrell. And Gail, if I can turn to you now. Uh, th three words stand out to me from this conversation, intentionality, investment in innovation. And we've got to focus on those and it, it can't be without investment. I mean, I've been very lucky um, here at the College at Wise that, to um, have a chancellor who really is um, very invested in the student experience. You know, a lot of our student affairs colleagues across the country took a pretty big hit in terms of staffing and, and, and other types of resource investment um, with the pandemic and we, can't change and innovate the student experience without investment in it. Thank you, Gail and Jamila. I'll make it we'll quick. You. 
Yeah, thanks everyone for the opportunity and learn so much from my colleagues today. Um, I, I would say again, going back to language and thinking about tone, right? So even how we check in with students is really important. So a student hasn't shown up to class for two days, instead of reminding the student that you're possibly jeopardizing your grade and may fail and have to retake this course, perhaps we just shift that to say, how are you doing? Let's check in. Is everything okay? Just changing that language has made such a positive difference for students as we think about building relationships and connections. They first have to feel that they're not being attacked or not being judged for not showing up, right? But something might be going on. And it goes back to the culture of care that we know is, uh, again, foundational to HBCUs and so many of my other colleagues here who, you know, demonstrate that, right, day in and, and day out. So I think thinking language and thinking tone and approach, really important to developing trusting relationships with students. Thanks, Jamila. That's a great note to end on. So I want to thank you and Terrell and Gail for participating in this important conversation. And thanks to our viewers for joining us. Thanks to our producer, Luna La Liberty, for keeping things running smoothly behind the scenes. A big thank you as well to Mongoose for sponsoring this session. Um, thanks to all the audience for the great questions. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to more of them today. But as I mentioned, we'll be reviewing them and they'll be helpful in informing our coverage. We'll be sending over a link uh, to the broadcast in the coming days and hope to see you uh, at future panels on the student experience. Until then, this is Katie Mangand for the Chronicle of Higher Education. Have a great rest of your day.